Um, I want to begin by thanking everyone for attending this evening. My many thanks to Ellen, as well as Matilda and the Cooper Hewitt for organizing and hosting this event. Um, it is with true, uh, a true privilege to be able to speak with you tonight uh, with Lenisa about these data visualizations. We, alongside Yao Fan Yu at the Cooper Hewitt, are co-curating an exhibition opening this November um, that explores the underpinnings of nationalism and colonialism that shaped the objects of modern design at the 1900 World's Fair in Paris. Central to this story is the 63 groundbreaking data visualizations produced by the sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois and his students at Atlanta University. Synthesizing graphic design with statistical data, these diagrams visualize the social and economic uplift achieved by Black Americans across the United States since emancipation, while presenting a biting and nuanced critique of institutionalized racism. I'm thrilled to say that for the first time in over 120 years, the exhibition Recharting Modern Design will give visitors the opportunity to see a selection of the original diagrams created by Du Bois and his students in person. This evening, I'll begin with a brief overview of how these data visualizations came to be shown in Paris. I then want to look closely at the diagrams themselves and discuss how they were produced and their place within the history of data visualization. Inaugurating the opening of the 20th century, the 1900 Paris World's Fair trumpeted the possibilities of technological, aesthetic, social, and economic advancement to a global audience. Under the shadow of the Eiffel Tower, nations competed to demonstrate their cultural and economic and thus political power vis-a-vis -vis carefully programmed pavilions of their most competitive industrial arts and reconstructions of native architecture from their colonial holdings. The United States embraced the fair as an important opportunity to showcase the industrial, social, and cultural progress it had made over the past century and announce itself on equal footing to national powers such as England, Germany, or France. As planning for the American presence at the fair was underway, Thomas J. Calloway seized upon the narratives of progress both the United States and the fair more broadly looked to project in order to claim a place for black Americans. A prominent lawyer, educator, and editor of the DC based newspaper, The Colored American, Calloway viewed it as essential that black Americans have a presence at the fair. The two previous world's fairs held within the United States, the 1876 Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia, and the 1893 Columbian World's Fair in Chicago, largely denied black representation at or participation in their proceedings and displays. This exclusion from the Chicago World's Fair, for example, drew a damning critique written by Ida B. Wells, Frederick Douglass, Irving Garland Penn, and Ferdinand Lee Barnett in the form of a pamphlet entitled, The Reason Why the Colored American is Not in the World's Columbian Exposition. Calloway was also deeply concerned about misrepresentation of black life around the world by the white press in the United States, particularly following the international coverage of the brutal torture and murder of Sam Hose in Georgia in 1899. When soliciting Booker T. Washington, the influential thinker and principal of the Tuskegee Institute for support, Calloway expressed his aims in writing. He wrote, quote, we owe it to ourselves to go before the world as Negroes. Everyone who knows about public opinion in Europe will tell you that the Europeans think us a mass of rapists, ready to attack every white woman exposed and a drug in civilized society. How shall we answer these slanders? Our newspapers they do not subscribe for. If we publish books, they do not buy them. If we lecture, they do not attend. To Paris, however, Thousands upon thousands of them will go and a well-selected and presented prepared exhibit will attract attention and do great and lasting good in convincing the thinking people of the possibilities of the Negro, end quote. With the backing of Washington and just a few months before the opening of the fair, Calloway successfully petitioned the United States government to include and fund a display organized under his direction that would demonstrate the social, economic, and cultural gains made by Black Americans since emancipation. 
The exhibition envisioned by Calloway would take shape as the American Negro exhibit. It would be installed in the Palace of Social Economy, a pavilion at the fair dedicated to international social reform movements. The exhibition as organized by Calloway consisted of several principal sections. The first was a display of tools and other agricultural products in swing cases sent by leading black industrial schools, such as the Hampton and Tuskegee Institutes. These displays were in line with Booker T. Washington's vision for the centrality of industrial and vocational training in the uplift of black America. A second section consisted of a selection of nearly 250 volumes of black literature compiled by Daniel A.P. Murray, assistant librarian at the Library of Congress, who was also responsible for acquiring the contents of the American Negro exhibit for the library in 1901. Finally, Calloway enlisted his old classmate from Fisk University in Tennessee, W.E.B. Du Bois, to contribute a detailed sociological study of black life in the United States. Du Bois was born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts in 1868. He received a bachelor's degree from Fisk and a second from Harvard, where he studied under the American philosopher, William James. Following a two-year fellowship at Friedrich Wilhelm University in Berlin, Du Bois became the first black doctoral candidate or graduate of Harvard writing his dissertation on the suppression of the African slave trade. Before becoming a professor at Atlanta University in 1897, he conducted a widely influential study of Philadelphia's Seventh Ward for the University of Pennsylvania, the first such sociological study of a Black community in the United States. Du Bois's contribution to the American Negro exhibit was as uncompromising as it was subversive. He and his student collaborators at Atlanta University not only created over 60 data visualizations charting the daily lived experience of Black America. They also compiled a rich collection of photographs for, of Black Americans, as well as a 400 page handwritten transcription of the Black Codes of Georgia, tracing a genealogy of legal oppression within the state for over a century and a half. Of the data visualizations, Du Bois and his students presented two sets of data. The first, the Georgia Negro, a social study, was a detailed case study illustrating the progress made by Black Americans over the past 35 years in the state. The second data set, a series of statistical charts illustrating the conditions of the descendants of former African slaves now in residence in the United States of America, was a broader national survey of the condition of Black Americans. While distinct, there were frequent overlaps between the two series. With the title card for the Georgia Negro, Du Bois established the central thesis of his research as well as for the American Negro exhibit itself. In a line that would be made famous three years later in his influential text, The Souls of Black Folk, he declared, quote, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, end quote. The decision to vibrantly illustrate the data he and his team collected on 23 by 30 inch poster boards drew upon a long tradition of progressive activists and statisticians in the 19th century using such techniques to make visible systemic patterns within society. William Playfair, Charles Joseph Menard, Andre Michel Guerry, and Florence Nightingale, whose work is discussed in Design and Healing on view now at the Cooper Hewitt, all made sizable contributions to this history. Work on the project was under inc an incredibly tight schedule, only beginning in late December, 1899, about three and a half months before the fair opened on April 15th. And this is not including the time that would be taken into consideration for actually packing and shipping all of these materials across the Atlantic to Paris. Du Bois relied heavily on his students, particularly William Andrew Rogers, a sociology graduate and instructor at what is now Virginia State University, who is a principal point person for Du Bois. This collective and collaborative all hands on deck endeavor fundamentally shaped the design of these data visualizations. As Silas Monroe has described, the typography used across 
data visualizations vary. For most of the diagrams, a lettering guide was used, not unlike this later example produced by Kofo and Esser, to standardize the drawing of typefaces. Because the letters and numbers were limited in the guides, punctuation such as percentage marks differ at times from one diagram to the next. In the series of statistical charts, the titles for diagrams are drawn inconsistently. Some use mechanically drawn lettering, while other visualizations, well, for other visualizations, letterpress was used instead. Again, a possible indication of the time pressures the team was under. Or in the case of this chart illustrating population increases, there is a combination of letterpress for the title, mechanical lettering for the data along the axes, and a unique handwritten script for the key within the graph itself. In each variation of percentile mark, or stroke of watercolor is the indexed presence of these unnamed students who, as Du Bois would later write, completed, quote, 50 or more charts in colors with accuracy, with little money, limited time, and not much encouragement, end quote. Such a compressed deadline, with such a compressed deadline, Du Bois and his team relied heavily on popular atlases, US census data, and Du Bois' own research, including his work for the Bureau of Labor and the Atlanta Conferences, an annual sociological conference focused on the study of Black life in the United States, organized by Du Bois and hosted by Atlanta University. For example, Du Bois follows a model of surveying he used in the Philadelphia Negro to map over three different charts, the population and socioeconomic condition of Black Georgians in different towns. In the second half of the 19th century, statistical atlases based on, upon census data by Francis Amasa Walker and later Henry Gannett emerged as innovative sites for data visualization. Du Bois and his team turned directly to these sources, adapting at times the format and design of certain charts from these atlases, as in the case of this illustration of marriage rates. At other points, Du Bois and his students appear to have creatively altered the gridded diagrams of occupations from Walker's Statistical Atlas of 1874, based on the 1870 census, into their own unique geometric system of representing Black business ownership. While copying or innovating aided expediency, it was not done uncritically by Du Bois and his team. They also challenged the narrative content conveyed by their source material through data visualizations that reflect a remarkable process of intertextual critique. Take for example, the diagram illustrating the gradation of racial identity in the United States by Du Bois and his team. Questions about what constituted blackness were widely debated in the 1890s as Jim Crow laws recently codified by the Supreme Court with Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, relied upon a binary construction of race to enact their oppressive restrictions. The United States Census of 1890 reflects this fascination with categorizing race biologically through hereditary, hereditary bloodlines. This census introduced categories of quadroon and octroon, indicating one fourth and one eighth African ancestry respectively. While echoing the form of a diagram from the 1894 statistical atlas, again, based on the 1890 census, charting population growth based on identity. Du Bois' diagram gradually blends colors from whites to yellow to brown to black, blurring and thus critiquing the binary logic underpinning Jim Crow's racialized hierarchy. The liminality of this gray area is literalized in their use of a gray-green font for the category of mulattoes in the center of the graph. In a line chart, tracing financial valuation that follows precedents from past statistical atlases, the Du Bois team highlights the exponential growth in wealth achieved by Black Americans since emancipation. In this diagram though, they do not retreat from illustrating how the rise of the KKK or entrenchment of Jim Crow laws directly affected the prosperity of Black communities over the past 35 years.
In the third example, Du Bois draws upon the history of choropleth maps to use to document the population of enslaved peoples in the United States and puts it through a complete process of inversion. The diagram of Georgia presents in technicolor a celebration of the property now owned by black residents in the state. In a different chart from uh, Du Bois's series on the right entitled The Rise of the Negro from Slavery to Freedom in One Generation, Du Bois would emphatically write, quote, this advance was accomplished entirely without state aid and in the face of prescriptive laws. As polemical as these charts were, they were also visually innovative, often out of necessity to display the collected data legibly. This spiraling bar graph, for example, creates a looping hypnotic form that would have been essential to grabbing the attention of passersby at the Palace of Social Economy. But it also allows for the sizable disparity between the assessed value of household and kitchen furniture in 1875 versus 1899 and the years between to fit seamlessly together on this limited space, on the limited space of the poster board. A similar inventive approach is taken to address taxable property in this reinvented pie chart. In the, this visualization, the values of taxable property for each five-year increment, incremental increase, uh, increase at a variable rate. By layering all of the data into a bullseye-like display and using the tears to reveal each half decade of growth like rings in a tree, the diagram unfurls its data narratively. This would have also, have also invited visitors to the exhibit to stay longer and better understand the data of the displays. Du Bois was keenly aware of the international audience that he was addressing. The series of statistical charts were completed in both English and French, the latter being the lingua franca for most visiting the fair, and included data visualizations which contextualized aspects of black life with those of differing European nations. For Du Bois, his project was a global one. Through his involvement with the Pan-African movement, he would attend the inaugural Pan-African conference in London while visiting Europe and the fair. He saw parallels between racial apartheid in the United States and that of colonialist incursions and rule throughout the globe. This was on display in the structure of the 1900 World's Fair itself, at which colonial pavilions and the people performing within them catered to a Eurocentric gaze that presented colonized societies as quote unquote primitive and thus in the need of the civilizing mission of European incursion and control. Du Bois and his team combated myths about illiteracy and birth rates that underpin the social Darwinist studies and racial, racist mythologies that were used to justify such systems of oppression in the United States and around the globe. To end on the question Thomas J. Calloway rhetorically posited to Booker T. Washington, how shall we answer these slanders? Du Bois and his students provided a clear answer. A tour de force, their multimedia display deconstructed the stereotypes, pseudoscientific beliefs and lost cause narratives used to justify the institutionalization of white supremacy while giving no ground on celebrating the triumphs achieved by black Americans in the face of Jim Crow at the turn of the century. Thank you so much. And hopefully this will be able to tee off Lenise's talk as well. Thank you, that was amazing. Really appreciate it. Um, so Lenisa, we welcome you to, um, to begin. Thank you, just bear with me as a, a formal. Take your time, I sure. Share my screen. Okay, am I sharing? Can you see me okay? Yes, we see oh. you and we see your slides. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Cooper Hewitt, Matilda, Ellen, 
uh, Devin, the entire team at the Cooper Hewitt for the good work that you are doing in the field of design and for providing me with an opportunity to share a few thoughts that I have about Du Bois's data visualizations. I think a good place to start is really with the run-up to the Paris Exposition. Uh, and I think it's important to note, and Devin has done some of this work for me already, so I'll just do a double thank you, uh, Devin, uh, is to think about the run-up to, to, to the Paris Exposition, where Du Bois had been prior to exhibiting uh, the, the charts uh, and the data visualizations. Uh, and so um, I'll start with uh, you know, Du Bois really sort of beginning at Fisk University H and HBCU. He's there from 1885 to 1888. He then moves to Harvard University. Uh, he's there from 1888 to 1890, uh, but in 1892 at 23, after receiving his bachelor's, Du Bois travels to Germany to attend Friedrich Wilhelm's Universität zu Berlin, uh, which today is Humboldt University on scholarship. Leading up to this moment, Du Bois is immersed in German studies, you know, he's reading plays by Schiller, you know, he's read, he's read Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, um, you know, he's been exposed at this point to Gustav von Schmoller, Adolf Wagner, Heinrich von Treitschke, and Emitz Max Weber, among others, to return to uh, the United States in 1895 to finish a PhD at Harvard. And this is an interesting point because the subject of his dissertation is on the suppression of the slave trade to the United States from 1638 to 1870, which becomes his first published book. Now, tellingly, uh, in an excerpt from chapter 12 of his dissertation, which is entitled Essentials on the Struggle, Essentials of the Struggle, Du Bois writes, Quote, it behooves the United States in the interest both of scientific truth and of future social reform, carefully to study such chapters of her history as that of the suppression of the slave trade. The most obvious question which this study, his dissertation suggests is, how far in a state can a recognized moral wrong safely be compromised. Now, importantly, uh, that for today's discussion, Du Bois's dissertation diagrams the evolution of the 1807 Act prohibiting importation of slaves uh, to any port in the United States. He charts the 1807 Act beginning with Senator Joseph Bradley Varnum's 1805 proposition to amend the constitution and abolish the slave trade. Now, an important side note here is that the constitution included a provision that empowered states to import and accept migrants however they saw fit and that Congress could not prohibit or restrict state action in this regard until 1808. Now, by this point, African Americans had already comprised 20% of the US population. So one might argue that the act was slow, quite slow, and quite late coming. But for, du, for, the, for the purpose of, of Du Bois' effort, Du Bois's effort, the diagram charts the 1807 Act from that moment of Senator Bradley's 1805 proposition through to it being tabled for a year and then being introduced to Congress as a bill in 1806. Du Bois charts readings, amendments, and reports as milestones through to the passage of the bill in both houses of Congress, its enrollment, and ultimately its signing into law by the President of the United States on March 2nd, 1807. Now on the screen, and I hope you all can see it clearly without all of the extra things that I see on my screen here, but a cursory glance at the diagram suggests that Du Bois may have seen the country or at least its legislative pro uh, process, particularly on the topic of slavery, as a house divided. 
two parallel vertical lines consume the majority of the diagram. Toward the bottom, the line wavers in between the two houses in a series of staggered horizontal lines before it jumps to stark angular uh, lines between both houses uh, uh, um, of Congress. The diagram conveys a slow process leading to a layered and at times somewhat chaotic process of signing the 1807 Act into law. Now, interestingly, toward the bottom portion of the diagram, the lines between the two houses take on triangular shape, reminiscent of maps depicting not only the transatlantic slave trade and the Middle Passage, but other trade routes as well. And I'll give an example, just jumping ahead for a second uh, to, to a map showcasing some of this triangular patterning and this sort of back and forth uh, motion of exchange. Um, um, interestingly, too, the diagram seems to presage or signal one of Du Bois's most provocative quotes about two-ness, which, or double-ness, which appears in the souls of Black folks. Uh, and I will quote it here at some length, so, so please bear with me. Uh, and I may have it uh, up on the screen for you to read along with me. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused content and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body, whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. The history of the American Negro is the history of this strife, this longing to attain self-conscious manhood, to merge his double self into a better and truer self. In this merging, he wishes neither of the older selves to be lost. He does not wish to Africanize America, for America has too much to teach the world and Africa. He wouldn't bleach his Negro blood in a flood of white Americanism, for he knows that Negro blood has a message for the world. He simply wishes to make it possible for a man to be both a Negro and an American without being cursed and spit upon by his fellows, without having the doors of opportunity closed roughly in his face. In view of the dissertation diagram, which I'll just scroll back to, one can wonder whether Du Bois's quote on Tunis might also apply to the fractured conduct and consciousness of America as evidenced in this house divided, particularly on the topic of slavery. I start with this early background in thinking about Du Bois's dissertation diagram because it captures three critical points that must be considered when looking at the visualizations presented at the 1900 World Fair. The first is that Du Bois is building on these dual identities, this doubleness, two orientations that were seemingly, that are, that are at odds with each other in many instances, instances, and that is captured and reflected in his later work on double consciousness from which I just quoted. On the one hand, Du Bois leading into the 1900 um, uh, exposition in Paris. On the one hand, he's drawing from his roots and training uh, in the African-American experience vis-a-vis -vis his upbringing and his training at Fisk. And on the other hand, he's drawing from his experience as an emerging sociologist steeped in the German tradition um, based on his early readings and his time in Berlin. Uh, so by the time Du Bois lands uh, in, um, let's just scroll ahead here, lands uh, in Paris, he's got an agenda. He's got a very clear agenda. And the agenda really is to highlight the beauty, the diversity, the strength, the power of African-American intellectualism, of African 
American humanity, and by extension, of course, the humanity of enslaved African peoples. And so alongside the charts uh, that, 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 that Devin so beautifully uh, spoke of just a moment ago that were exhibited uh, at the uh, uh, Paris Exposition, Du Bois presents 500 photographs, 32 charts uh, that Devin just referenced uh, a few of, numerous maps, and notably a display of 200 books written by African Americans. Ultimately, Du Bois is exhibiting African American humanity in its finest form, a humanity that demonstrated exceptional intellectualism, exceptional understanding uh, and skill in both visual and written literacies. Now, the photographs um, of affluent, you know, young African American men and women challenged the dominant perception of the day, which were racist caricatures, uh, you know, which, which depicted African uh, peoples, peoples of African descent in the darkest imaginable terms. Um, the second point that I wanna call attention to is that Du Bois in sort of exhibiting this, this, this African and African uh, American uh, humanity uh, is intentionally drawing upon and advancing a legacy of visualizing the African-American experience at the turn of the century, stemming from his early dissertation research and then moving into the charts that we see in Paris. You know, he's drawing on the likes of folks like Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells, and if we were to take it back farther to the continent, we could look at the Bamum Kingdom and other um, scripts and visualizations, graphic sign systems coming out of the continent. Uh, and then the, thirdly, these visualization charts um, are, are meant to dispel, as I mentioned a moment ago, these dominant notions of African savagery by inadvertently signaling indigenous African uh, graphic communication systems. They showcase both the intellectual complexities and the capacities of people of African descent. In this context, I'm attempting to broaden examination of Du Bois's charts to include a wider lens through which to view the relationship between the written word and the graphic sign as critical tools of articulation in Africa and its diasporas. And so doing, um, you know, what, what, what Du Bois is doing and, and, and in, in channeling these these, these, these graphic systems and indigenous technologies um, uh, at the turn of the century, which, you know, again, were, were overwhelmingly uh, negative. Um, you know, the idea or the dominant image was that black Africans uh, and enslaved African peoples were considered savages and illiterate without knowledge systems and advanced communication technologies of their own. And these myths were propagated as justification for the enslavement and subsequent colonization of African peoples. And another side note here that I'd like to call attention to uh, that I think is worth noting is that in fact, uh, Western writing as we know it is a descendant from Egyptian uh, is descendant of Egyptian knowledge systems and communication technologies, namely hieroglyphs dating back more than 5,000 years to the fourth millennium. Historians and linguists in turn link these hieroglyphs to ancient pictographs and ideograms. Together, these systems shape and influence the development of Hebrew, Arabic, by extension, Greek, Roman, Cyrillic. Um, to be clear, all modern scripts that we know of, except Chinese, are offsprings of Egyptian writing symbols uh, and graphic design systems. So in other words, it all started in Africa. So there's, a, there's an interesting irony um, in that, you know, these sort of sign systems, these diagrams, these charts, these written um, uh, legacies and literacies uh, become the tool to, by which to affect uh, a humanity uh, for people of African descent. And the evolution and retention of these technologies in spite of the slave trade are evident in the charcoal writings uh, in Arabic on the jailhouse wall, 
in North Carolina where Omar Ibn Said, an enslaved African man wrote verses of the Quran in Arabic script where he wrote letters with diagrams in them uh, and where later in 1831, he published a 15 page autobiography, autobiography also in Arabic script. And I'm just gonna uh, pause here and flip through some of the images because one thing that I did not mention but should is that Du Bois is very strategic and deliberate in what he has on display uh, in, in Paris. Um, and while there are many images depicting uh, businessmen and churches and homes and, and, and um, uh, 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 community settings, uh, a vast majority of these images actually depict libraries and um, you know, people of African descent in, li in, in learning environments in the context of, uh, uh, in the process of reading books. So here are a few images. Um, this is the library at Claflin. Uh, this is an image, these are images of young girls in the process of reading. And then here is an image of uh, women sitting on uh, the library steps at Atlanta University. Uh, so this is this 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 idea of literacy, this representation of um, black folks' engagement in the literary act, in the written act, in the in the signaling of past um, practices, and the retention of them in African and African American expressive culture, despite the uh, experience of slavery, is remarkably uh, significant. Uh, and I also mentioned a moment ago uh, the, the writings of Omar Ibn Said. So I will uh, flip to an image of him here. Uh, again, you know, he's you know, captured uh, from the Senegambia region, uh, put into slavery. Um, he attempts to flee a slavery, but is later uh, being enslaved and is later uh, caught and imprisoned in North Carolina. And he begins to write on the jailhouse walls and charcoal. And this captures the amazement of um, several folks, including the governor. Uh, and uh, ultimately it, 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 it leads the way to uh, Omar Ibn Said's uh, ability to tell his own story in Arabic script. And in the process, he is writing letters uh, about himself his culture, his identity. And as you can see here, using uh, diagram to, to, as, as, as a means of expressive culture. Um, these, the, the retention of these technologies uh, are also evident uh, in the works of uh, um, uh, here, uh, Abdul Rahman uh, Ibn Ibrahim Sori, uh, who was also uh, pulled from uh, the uh, Senegambia uh, region and enslaved here in the United States and affected ultimately his return uh, to uh, Africa, Liberia in particular, not his home, but uh, um, to Liberia nonetheless, through his ability to write his story in Arabic script and to in fact win uh, the attention of, um, of his uh, captors. We can also think of examples uh, in Phyllis Wheatley, uh, in Frederick Douglass, in Ida B. Wales, among other Ida B. Wells, among others, who each use the written word and visualization uh, to write alternative narratives of the Black experience in one way or another, all to the end of executing. Uh, the freedom. The point here is threefold. First, demonstrations of written and visual literacies have worked hand in hand in the execution of freedom for people of African descent since their enslavement in the United States. Secondly, enslaved African peoples drew upon and advanced their own written technologies and graphic design systems to articulate their identity separate and apart from dominant perceptions of African and African Americans prior to, during, and since the 19th century. Um, sorry, I'm just a little parched here, bear with me. 
The next turn in um, my, my, my research on Du Bois's charts uh, that I am um, unpacking is the color symbolism of them. And so what you'll see here is that without going into too close a reading because some of these charts have already been well read by other scholars in the field, um, there's this strong reliance, not only in the charts represented here, but throughout the other charts uh, in the collection here at the library on black, red, and green, moving into yellow or gold. I find it very interesting, and this is, this is where my uh, research is, is leading uh, me now, uh, that the dominant colors in the majority of Du Bois's charts emerge as the chief colors of black liberation in the plan African flag, red, black, green, and in some instances, gold. These colors in turn become the dominant symbols of black freedom during the 1920s through to the 1960s, through to the 1980s, through today. Uh, the black, and I'll just move to a couple of uh, shots that I grabbed of uh, the Ghanaian independence flag at the bottom and two iterations of the black liberation flag. Um, the black within the context of Pan-Africanism uh, uh, symbolizes black people. The red symbolizes the blood shed by and also shared between African people. And the green symbolizes growth, hope and accomplishment for black people everywhere. Now recognizing that the flag was created by Du Bois's contemporary, the, the black liberation flag was created by Du Bois's contemporary and depending upon which scholarly community you engage his rival Marcus Garvey. Um, um, you know, but that it, but that it came, that it became the emblem of a pan-Africanism and a black freedom the world over just 20 years after Du Bois brought these colors to the world stage and connected them to the black experience in America is intriguing to me. Um, and, and I think that there's a lot of work to be done here and looking at the visual force of the, of, of the flags and the symbolism of them juxtaposed against the charts. Uh, I definitely think that they are in conversation with each other in interesting and provocative ways that the charts in many ways presage and, and suggest or lead into what we become to appreciate across uh, the global community as the emblem uh, and image of Black freedom in terms of, and Black liberation in terms of uh, the, 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 the color symbolism here. Um, in closing, I, I, I'm positing that Du Bois charts, Du Bois's charts challenge the violence of the whiplash line by putting forward alternative views of alternative views of African American progress, particularly in the realm of written and visual literacies, legacies, and diagrams. Uh, and that the charts engage the color line, certainly within the context of the racial divide in America, but also in terms of their color symbolism. Um, and that ultimately all of these lines suggest a turn to the black star line, which is and was always intended to bring African and African-Americans and all their beauty intellectualism and diversity back to the continent. The Black Star Line being both the ship that Marcus Garvey uh, um, envisioned for the return of African peoples to the continent and ultimately the Black Star Line as evidenced in the star of the Ghanaian flag, which was the first uh, country in Africa to um, win independence. So with that, I will leave it there with hope that my comments and my thinking around Du Bois's charts and their significance, um, particularly within the context of written and visual legacies uh, in uh, Africa and the African diaspora more broadly, will excite conversation uh, among us. I'm happy to be in dialogue with all of you.
Thank you so much. Thank you for that beautiful talk. Thanks so much, Lanisa. Wow. Um, so we're going to have um, some questions, which is really exciting. I'm going to bring our speakers back um, into visibility. So you could put your um, uh, camera on. And Devin, I'm going to pin you here too. Thank you. So Matilda, do you want to start off with a question from the Q&A? Sure. So we got a question, a very great question. Actually, it's another one. Um, do you know of other data visualization activists who are living today who have taken the legacy of Du Bois and others to make an impact um, in similar lines, along similar, in similar ways? Nice question. That's a great question. Um, jumping in, you know, the first two that pop to mind, uh, and there's so many. Um, I mean, the work that's been done on these data visualizations has kind of opened up, you know, so many designers and 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 activists to just the profound importance of data visualization as as a way of controlling um, narratives and and recontextualizing uh, the data that we all kind of consume and perceive. You know, uh, the first names that pop to mind, uh, you know, Mona Chinlabi did uh, a great uh, series of data visualizations in response to Du Bois's work at the House of Illustration in London. This was two or three years ago. Um, and even artists like the Esther Gates, who has done a really remarkably beautiful series of um, works in response to these materials as well, which I think were up at the Wadsworth Athenaeum, if I recall correctly a year or so ago in an exhibition in 2020. Um, but you know, those are two that just popped to mind. There's uh, so many more doing all, Aldrich, thank you, thank you. Museum, perfect. Um, but there's so many, so many great activists and designers working in, in inspired by and in the tradition of Du Bois' activism as well. Lisa, do you have any? Yep, you know, what immediately in addition to, of course, uh, what Devin shared is the work of Nicole Hannah-Jones. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. she uh, does use data visualizations within the context of sort of mapping uh, uh, school segregation today. Uh, and I think that is sort of a direct parallel to, um, you know, uh, some of the ways in which Du, du Bois um, uh, engaged data visualization. So I think uh, she's probably at the forefront of my mind within the context of that question. Great. So I got a few more questions here. Um, first of all, wonderful talk, um, Sarah Lickman says, who's the director of the, the program. Um, and she asked, can you discuss a little bit about the journey the charts took after the Paris Expo? Where did they go next? Did they tour anywhere? Um, were they collected directly into the Library of Congress? And if so, were they exhibited there or stored away until they were rediscovered more recently? Uh, yeah, I can take, so they, the, the charts went on an American tour uh, beginning in Buffalo in 1901 after, after the, the Paris exhibition. Um, and then did a tour through the United States before they were then uh, acquired and entered into the Library of Congress. And to my knowledge, and Lisa, you could correct me on this, they've been in storage since. I, these data visualizations are remar remarkably fragile. Um, they were meant to go on display as ephemeral objects for this ephemeral exhibition. Um, and thanks to the kind of quick thinking of, uh, of um, uh, Daniel A.P. Murray, you know, acquired all of this material, understanding that the preservation of them was essential. But it's, you know, it's poster board from 1900, 1899 that was shipped across the Atlantic and back across the Atlantic and then brought through the, the heart of the United States. Um, you know, so, so they, access to these data visualizations is difficult. 
Um, and because of just just their their delicacy, their their you know, these fragile, beautiful objects um, that has unfortunately kind of limited their their public display. Can you give us a, a little picture of how they will appear at Cooper Hewitt and what else will be in the exhibition? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm really I'm excited. so excited. <laughs> I, so, you know, work, Lenise and I working as well as with the Alpha and you um, have really wanted to kind of rethink both how the story of especially objects of design uh, coming from the Cooper Hewitt, you know, are discussed and detailed. And so we'll be presenting uh, these data visualizations in dialogue with the various objects of Art Nouveau and other forms of modernist design at the fair. And as Lenisa kind of alluded to, probing the parallel between Du Bois's color line and the whiplash line that guided, financed, and influenced so much of Art Nouveau's design and the kind of imperial and colonialist origins of those materials. Um, and then, you know, just having these wonderful dialogues with, with these data visualizations and the objects that were created contemporaneously with them. I was really moved by Lenisa's quote, the violence of the whiplash line. And I have to say, as someone who's, you know, attended numerous design history lectures, no one ever, in my experience, pointed out that the idea of a whiplash is violent. Mm -hmm. It was always presented as an aesthetic idea. So, Lenisa, could you say a little bit more about that? And for, perhaps for people who aren't familiar with how the word is used to describe <laughs> Art Nouveau formal inventions? Sure, uh, but let me take a turn back to a question that was uh, asked, I think, just a moment ago about the charts themselves. You know, Du Bois wanted uh, to receive the charts back from the library, and for a number of reasons, uh, we at the Library of Congress just weren't able to execute on that ask. Um, and they did, you know, just kind of sit in storage until um, not too long ago, they were digitized. Uh, and through their digitization, they are now widely available to anyone who wishes to land on the LOC website or in the interweb uh, more broadly. Uh, and then in terms of, you know, Ellen, your question, about the whiplash line. Um, I have to you know, give a nod here to Devin uh, because in the early conceptualization of uh, the exhibition that we're working on together, he turned me on to an article that I had never encountered before that took a very close look at the whiplash line within the context of the Belgian Congo. And uh, within, of course, not just the context of the Belgian Congo, but also by turn, how it has the, the, the concept of that sort of um, whip, if you will, has been replicated, reinvented, and recycled uh, in many ways through design practices, almost in a sort of oblivious, I, 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 you know, not intentional, but perhaps unintentional, unconscious way, but still nonetheless signaling this very horrific history uh, coming out of the Belgian Congo and beyond. And of course, in my conceptualization and, and sort of reading and engagement with um, uh, the article that uh, Devin uh, recommended, and Devin, I'll just turn to you because it's after five and my memory is slipping a little bit. Um, the name is just right here. Uh, Deborah Silverman's. Deborah Silverman, that's it. Dark. Deborah yeah. Silverman. Thank um, you, Brockett Horn, for the. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then I start to think about the whiplash line and the dominant sort of image of slashed backs of enslaved African peoples in the United States who are working hours on end in cotton fields, you know, to the benefit of a slave master who is by turn profiting uh, from that free labor. And, and in turn, the sort of long sort of history, um, some of which I've, I've, I've attempted to document in my, in my presentation of the liberation of those people, the whiplash line, of course, um, in a very literal sense, but also in a metaphorical sense, I guess, is the sort of context within, within which 
you know, I, I'm thinking about the whiplash line. And so when you put that in a conversation with the aesthetics of Art Nouveau, I think there's provocative conversations uh, for us to have, for sure. And I'll jump in to say too, that this is also all part of uh, what will be on the second floor is recharting modern design, as well as Yao Fen's uh, exhibition re-examining Hector Guimard's work. So there'll be a wonderful dialogue between Guimard as this inventor of Art Nouveau and the entanglement between all of these issues that Lanisa has just summarized so beautifully. And, you know, this, this kind of titan of, uh, of Art Nouveau that one thinks about when they see the Paris Metro stations and others. And look at how, uh, you know, this kind of entanglement globally of commodity, of form, of peoples kind of can so fundamentally affect these, you know, beautiful surface objects, but also that there's deeper stories to be told there as well. And if I could just add one point, because now De De Deborah Silverman is just, um, <laughs> anyway, what, what, another piece of this that uh, is resonating, and I hope it's not too much of a teaser here, but, uh, you know, just the sort of uh, representation and use of flora and fauna and foliage uh, in, in, in Art Nouveau uh, and um, uh, really in the arts and crafts movement too, you know, there's a sort of long history there. Uh, but how, uh, when we're thinking within the context of Deborah Silverman, how um, there's this signaling of the rubber vine and to think that hands were, were lost for not being able to tap enough rubber to be able to send back uh, to Belgium for the profit of that tiny little space uh, in Europe. So when I speak of the violence um, and, and, and some of the flora and the fauna and the foliage uh, seem to, to echo and also function in conversation with the whiplash line for sure. When I speak of the violence, in part I'm doing so as a trained Africanist who cannot ignore the histories of exploitation, of just devastation to the continent that were born out of, um, you know, a European colonialism in the con on the continent, uh, and also the African American experience of enslavement in the United States. Thank you. There are a couple of more questions that re relate to influence. Um, so one was how accurately we do we know whether Charles Menard or Florence Nightingale influenced Du Bois's approach to visualization, and then also um, are there other you know charts later on that were influenced um, by um, by these charts? I I brought in um, Menard and and Nightingale more to just sort of place Du Bois and his project within a, a kind of tradition that's emerging in the 19th century. This, this zeitgeist that takes over the century as data is being collected and these, uh, the use of data in these kind of progressive ca causes to illustrate the benefit of kind of these systemic structures that they can then illuminate and, and, uh, and help resolve. So in that sense, no, I don't think Du Bois necessarily looked at a Florence Nightingale data visualization per se and tried to copy it off of that. I think he was more working in his team, especially were more working with kind of what was more immediate atlases, census materials and other visualizations that also nevertheless were coming out of this similar uh, tradition. Um, and I, they were scouring, I mean, this is a visual culture at the end of the 19th century. So there was so much material for them to, to adapt, to copy, to reappropriate, to, to play with and invent from. Um, so in that sense, you know, I, I think it's, it's more loose and not directly that he was copying or inspired by any one individual. Um, as for later data visualizations, I mean, this, you know, uh, comes up who would have seen them at the fair, um, you know, and then subsequently went on to want to imitate or copy these materials. Uh, I, I can't say, um, but you know, it, it, it's more, I, I view these things as, as products of a, a time and a certain logic um, that was embraced by so many kind of early uh, scholars and, and professionals in these, these uh, you know, humanitarian professions um, or, or the humanities who are working with these kinds of newly invented forms of data sets and visualizing. 
Yeah, I mean, the one of the 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 person who asked the question um, actually mentioned Edward Tufte, for example, mm. as someone. And I don't I I don't know. Um, I mean, I've seen Edward Tufte's, but I'm not sure if you know if there's any direct correlation or possibly. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. You mean if Tufte ever has written about Du Bois or looked at Du Bois's uh -huh. work and you know influenced his own kind of data visualization? Because there are some very original constructs like the spiral graph and that yeah. exploded pie chart that right. you know so on the one hand du, du Bois working with as a sociologist and working with the social science of the, the day and being very um, on top of it you know <laughs> and then finding these new ways to uh, represent data it was really fascinating there's also some questions about production and what kind of materials, what was the process? Um, Devin, you mentioned that there was hand lettering and, and letterpress together. Was there a printing facility at the college where Du Bois and his students were working? Yeah, they would have had access to, to printing materials. Um, just, you know, that for the amount of publications the university was doing anyway, to have these kind of printing press materials would have been uh, accessible. And I, I, I feel like, I, I, there's moments where I look at these charts and there's so many ways to look at these charts, but there's times where I look at them and I think these are students under a deadline and they're just trying to kind of get through and you could see the passion and the rush and, you know, as they fill in and, and this is what it will be so wonderful about seeing these data visualizations in the flesh in person is the, the, the coloring in of these bars and diagrams and everything is all by hand. It's all of these students kind of collecting and expressing these these stories about you know these black communities that it, it had no other kind of you know sizable representation on the scale and to do it with such passion and with such little time um, you know it, it's it's remarkable um, so so yeah they they worked with the the poster boards that they would have collected a lot of standard you know drawing uh, and lettering uh, guides and other materials that were readily available especially for sociology students who would present their materials in kind of you know uh, uh, public spaces and uh, then just the the brute will of graduate students under pressure <laughs> i have some of them <laughs> some of them are in the audience tonight <laughs> So that's great. Um, people are also curious about the reception. Like, was there a lot of press? It, it's very interesting that Du Bois was creating something to counter the dominant representation of African-Americans in the press. How did the press respond to this exhibit? I, I it, you know, it, it goes down to almost a prophetic uh, extension of some of Calloway's writing in his letter to, to Booker T. Washington, where, you know, it was it was documented in the U.S. survey of the World's Fair, um, but you know the predominantly white press didn't write extensively about it. Mm -hmm. It was uh, the black press that sort of covered it. It gained a lot of coverage, a lot of positive reviews. But again, it, it, it's this you know the the color line that divided the reception of the mm -hmm. the installation as well. Um, which then limited the amount of circulation. Well, I, I feel that we're so lucky that it was preserved by the Library of Congress and is now available to everyone. I put a link in the chat so that you can go and download TIFF files, graphic designers, <laughs> for all of these graphics and the amazing photographs as well. So maybe one, one last question. Um, what are some of the key lessons um, that you think we can learn from Du Bois um, and sort of effectively incorporating some of these visualizations um, into activism? Like how could, I mean, you know, looking, looking ahead um, and do you think this is, was this an important way of, of um, visualizing that and um, can we learn from that? I, I, I could jump in uh, on this one um, first, if, you, if that's okay with you, Devin. Um, Matilda, I think yes, absolutely. You know, um, Du Bois's whole effort uh, really is about 
showcasing, demonstrating, exhibiting, and all of this work. You know, we, we are, we're talking about the diagram that I mentioned in his dissertation, but that moves through to the charts that we see at the World Fair. That moves through also to a very a sort of prolific writing career uh, through the crises, through the publication of his books. And it's just this long sort of um, effort on Du Bois's part to showcase the humanity, the beauty, the intellectual heft of Black people everywhere, in America in particular, but everywhere really, because, you know, as we know, he makes his home in Ghana. Um, after having traveled to a few other uh, places in West Africa. Uh, and so I, I think when we encounter Du Bois, we are each challenged to rethink about, to rethink how we think about the African-American experience in the United States, particularly when it's handed to us in a tiny little package. Black folks are this, or black folks are that and they do this is sort of stereotypical treatment and limitation of the black American experiences is, is at the heart of Du Bois's effort. And I think, you know, the, the sort of uh, descendants of Du Bois, if you will, are sort of echoing the same sort of sentiment. It may come out differently. It may sound today um, like Black Lives Matter. It may have sounded in a different era, like the Black empowerment movement, and in a different era um, like a, within the context of the politics of respectability. But fundamentally, we are challenged to rethink how we engage the African-American experience in the United States and the experiences of people of African descent the world over. From that moment, of the first landing of the enslaved African person in the United States to the present moment today. And I think Du Bois is timeless in this regard. Thank you, it's a beautiful way to end. Thank you both for these uh, amazing um, presentations and, and above all for your research that will um, find a, another public forum at Cooper Hewitt and that people can see these things in person is wonderful. I want to invite you again to um, check out the other lectures in our series, Graphic Design Histories. On March 2nd, you can learn all about E. McKnight Coffer from two of Cooper Hewitt's amazing curators. We're going to talk about Bauhaus typography at the end of March. And then finally, visualizing the pandemic, which comes back <laughs> to these issues and many of those same principles that Du Bois used in his Philadelphia study were really key to the founding of epidemiology and the science of how, how diseases spread. So very fascinating material. Um, please come see us at Cooper Hewitt. We have beautiful exhibits to share with you. Um, and, and keep, uh, keep in touch with us online as well. Again, thank you Ellen, so much. Ellen, yes. may I just jump in really quickly at the 11th hour to plug yet another Smithsonian Institution Please. Museum. You know, I, within the course of my talk, um, went backward. And I think many of the questions have tasked us to look forward. Mm -hmm. But I think this retention of Africanisms and the turn to Africa um, as a site with immense, um, uh, extraordinary uh, writing systems and graphic systems is important work for anybody in the graphic design business to take on today. And so I'd like to, to call attention to the National Museum of African Art uh, at the Smithsonian Institution and to plug a particular exhibition catalog um, stemming from an exhibition by a former colleague of mine and um, uh, Christine Mullen Kramer. And the, the exhibition catalog is entitled Inscribing Meaning, Writing and Graphic Systems and African Art. And so when we start talking about ideograms, pictograms, diagrams, visualizations, you know, well before enslaved African peoples arrived to the United States, this is already part of the knowledge system that is embedded and in, in, in their intellectual identities. And so if you can turn to that work uh, for more information on, on uh, 
the history that I've referenced in the presentation. Great, there's some info about um, Dr. Kramer for you to all learn more about. That's amazing. Yeah, the whole history of, of writing, we'd love to hear more about your collection at the Library of Congress. So another time, right. how fantastic. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much. And thank much. you thank to you, Christine and Courtney for the incredible live captions. We, we're very grateful to you.